Good afternoon, friends, again, and welcome to the STP training webinar, which is Rapid UI Test Automation, Avoiding the Pitfalls. Our speaker for the day is Dennis Markov Sev. I'm Smita Mishra, a professional tester myself, and I'm excited to host you all and Dennis on our STP webinars. Quick information for all of you. The next upcoming conference we have is Fall 2018 STPCon, which will be held at Arlington, Virginia from October 22nd to 25th this year. The complete program is up for your review and selection at stpcon.com. Early bird discounts are being offered until 24th of August, um, which is like uh, two weeks from now. So if you are coming with your team members, don't forget to ask for team discounts. And if you are one of our regular attendees who would like to come back again, and there are quite a few of them. So we also have alumni discount for you. Do reach out to us should you need any help on the registrations. You have the contact information there, info at softwaretestpro.com. Feel free to write to them about any questions or help you need. Uh, another quick piece of information is that there is an upcoming webinar, Demystifying uh, Mobile Application Testing by Raj Subramanian on 22nd of August. Raj is the developer evangelist for testim.io. He's a very active member of the community, uh, especially around automation. So the link is up for you to review and register. Check it out. And if you are on Twitter, please share the conference information and about this webinar with your followers, connections. You can also add STP's Twitter handle uh, to your tweets, which is at Software Test Pro. You can also note down the speaker's Twitter handle for Dennis. And uh, yeah, mine is not there. Next time onwards, I'm going to put mine. I like followers and tweets. All right, let's get started with the webinar today. A very warm welcome, Dennis. We are very thrilled to have, uh, have you with us today. And let me quickly introduce you for all of us here. Dennis is a principal software developer at Inflectra Corporation. He's one of the creators of Repi's test automation tool. He holds a master degree in computer science and PhD in mathematics, and has been working in the IT industry for past 18 years in areas such as compilers, software systems, software uh, verification, and testing. At Inflectra, Dennis has been responsible for researching the tools, technologies, and processes in the software testing and quality assurance space for the past five years. In his free time, Dennis likes to read, run, cycle, and travel. Quite a good fillers. OK, all right, Dennis, very warm welcome again. And the floor is all yours now. We will share your screen now. Lisa, thank you for the introduction. Uh, everything looks good. Do you see the screen? Yes, we can see your screen. All right. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad to be a participant in the STP community webinar. And I'm looking forward to attend STPCon uh, in October and see you there uh, in physical world. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, web UI uh, test automation and the technical difficulties that appear in real life uh, testing scenarios. Uh, when you do UI testing, especially UI test automation, uh, you notice that uh, projects uh, vary by complexity. The best uh, variant is when uh, a new application is developed uh, in a company and uh, testing efforts are performed uh, in parallel. Uh, with development. So in this case, QA team has access to developers and developers are ready to make the application uh, more uh, test friendly and uh, more suitable for, for testing. Uh, things become more complicated uh, when it is a legacy application, yellow square in this uh, picture. Uh, it was developed in the application some time ago. Uh, probably developers of this application already left. And uh, there, is, there is maybe some documentation. And at some point, management decides that uh, more testing should be done for the application. And in this case, uh, there is no access to developers uh, also, maybe to some knowledge. But 
definitely nobody will be doing any changes to the application that will make it more friendly for uh, test automation. And uh, the most complex uh, case uh, is a red square when it is an external application developed by some other companies. So for example, uh, CRM or ERP application. And uh, in your company, uh, you configure this application, uh, install add-ons, uh, perform some customization, and you want to check that it's after all their tweaks, it still behaves correctly, that it works well. In this case, there is no access to developers, almost no access to any documentation about internals of this application. It's like a black box. And uh, this is uh, the most uh, complex uh, thing. So uh, what I will show today uh, is mostly relevant uh, to yellow and uh, red squares. A uh, key point uh, for these project types is that developers are not going to change uh, anything for you. So you are on your own. And uh, despite all the project types, uh, there are all these technical challenges. So I think that most important of them are cross-browser recording uh, in playback. Uh, at least playback should be cross-browser. So you may record on just uh, one browser and then you want to execute uh, your test coverage on different browsers. Uh, this uh, problem mostly solved uh, today, but there are still uh, some issues. So a test that works uh, in some browsers may just uh, fail in another browsers because application behaves differently, or there are some problems with uh, our web application driver. The next is data loading and initialization delays. So we have a network application and uh, everything uh, is loading uh, into browser with some delay and it depends on user's network, on a server load, on a lot of factors. And uh, every time, uh, time that is needed to download something uh, is different and it requires you to insert some synchronization statements uh, into your uh, test. And the most important one, from my point of view, uh, is uh, DOM element identification. So uh, when you record a test or create a test and uh, construct express expressions uh, for selectors of elements manually, and then execute your tests. Uh, tests may uh, fail, uh, even though uh, XPath uh, worked uh, at the point when you created your test, it just may stop uh, to, to work. And here we face the problem of resilient uh, XPath generation. So what, as a software engineers, we, uh, we want, ideally, so we want that uh, our recorded tests should just uh, work uh, after uh, recording. So we record something and the test is ready for execution. Also, we want that uh, our test cases uh, should work uh, in a test suite. Um, personally, uh, I mm, face this situation many times when uh, you have a test set and each test uh, when you execute it standalone, it just works, no problem here. And when you combine them in a test suite and uh, execute uh, sequentially one by one, one or two fails, uh, one or two tests just may fail. And uh, it may be different tests every time. So this is especially true when the test coverage is uh, pretty young, it's not mature, and there are no uh, enough uh, synchronization statements. Uh, in test. So we want that uh, our test should work uh, in test suite. And also uh, we hope that uh, our test coverage uh, continue to work uh, after some small uh, changes uh, in the application on the test. So if there are some small changes in design or in layout, 
uh, we do not want to tweak our uh, expat uh, selectors. So uh, we want that our test should not be uh, flaky. So let's look at the typical uh, test scenario, which may look very simple and uh, straightforward for uh, manual tester. So it's very simple. You click on buttons, you enter some text uh, into edit field. And uh, what can go wrong here? But when you start uh, doing test automation, uh, you record the test or you create it manually uh, and you execute the test and something uh, goes uh, wrong. So actually here is uh, a typical situation. You record the test, execute, and it fails uh, at the very beginning. So uh, there are many uh, common reasons uh, why it may uh, happen. Uh, such common pitfalls uh, actually appear uh, in real life uh, testing scenarios. Actually, everything works well when you are trying some automation tool uh, with a login page uh, example. So you record username, password, login button, everything is fine. But when you get your tool and start testing, uh, some real life complex application, then you hit this uh, typical situation. And there are, um, and this is actually one of the reasons, one of the main reasons why uh, test automation uh, projects fail, especially when uh, people who uh, did manual testing before and they switch to test automation, uh, they expect that uh, what they record or what they create should just continue working. And they're surprised that it's, uh, their tests just uh, do not work uh, without any changes. And uh, bear in mind that uh, we cannot hope that developers uh, will help us much to change anything uh, in, the, in the application. So let's look at some of these uh, problems or uh, pitfalls. So for example, uh, dynamic ID. So in modern applications, our developers are more and more use uh, generation techniques. So they generate a markup and uh, it's convenient for them to assign dynamically generated IDs uh, to elements. So if you use such ID, are in your express expression and then execute uh, a test. And in the next session with the application, the test fails because ID is different, it is dynamic. So here are some more examples uh, which can be considered like uh, semi-dynamic uh, IDs. So they contain some meaningful information that may help to uh, identify an element during test playback, but it also contains some uh, dynamic, dynamic parts. Besides dynamic ID, uh, there is also a closure compiler, so which uh, is used heavily by Google services. If you will try to test something that uh, Google created, you will quickly find out that uh, not only IDs, but also class names uh, are generated. Maybe not every time uh, when you visit the page, but uh, with every new version uh, of the application deployed by Google. So something should be done here. So dynamic IDs shouldn't be used uh, in express selectors uh, of elements. Class attribute, uh, it's in simpler case but still uh, something that should be uh, taken into account when you do test automation. Uh, class attribute uh, may contain uh, several values. And uh, if you will write your express expression like this, uh, it will not work because uh, class attribute contains uh, all these values here. And uh, if you want to reliably use some class value to identify an element, you should write 
uh, something uh, more uh, sophisticated. Hidden layers. Uh, this is my favorite. Uh, so these days, uh, single page applications uh, are very popular. And uh, such applications uh, frequently do this thing. They just uh, cache uh, cont content. So imagine that uh, you are following a process in the application when you need to uh, fill uh, some forms. So you follow some steps, uh, you fill a few fields uh, on one page, then proceed to another. And uh, when you proceed to another page, the previous page is not unloaded. Elements uh, in this uh, page are still uh, cached uh, in the DOM tree. And if your test automation tool uh, does not uh, account for this situation, it will find uh, the element which is actually not displayed to a user. So here we have uh, one form uh, loaded and it has that index one and uh, another form has that index two and it overlaps uh, the previous form. And what to do in this case? So how to make sure that when we interact uh, with the element that this element is really displayed to the user. One of possible uh, ways how this can be done is to use anchor. So what is an anchor uh, in this case, in this example? So here is the anchor. This is express expression that just finds uh, the topmost uh, view in our SPA application. So here is the part that uh, gets uh, the last uh, SPA view um, div uh, in the parent uh, SPA div. And if we do search for our elements, always relative uh, to this anchor, we make sure that uh, if a button, uh, if an element is found, then uh, it is really displayed uh, to, to the user. Okay, uh, at Inflectra, uh, we gather it, uh, this and some uh, other puzzles uh, on the website and we created it for our educational our purposes. And uh, you can use it to uh, sharpen your uh, test automation skills and to learn better your, your test automation tool. So actually, let's go to uh, this website and I will show a couple of uh, more uh, examples uh, where something may go wrong when you test in application. Uh, what is good about this website, uh, it's not kind of a login page example where everything works and it's not as heavy as a real life uh, application where to reach some problem place you need to perform some complex steps, uh, authorize, login, uh, navigate through some screens and only after that reach uh, a place where something doesn't, roll, doesn't work. So here we artificially try to reproduce uh, most common uh, problems, most common pitfalls. So for example, let's go to a click here. So here is uh, a page uh, with a button. Uh, it is specially designed to uh, ignore uh, DOM event uh, click. Actually, when I, I just started uh, doing test automation, I was very surprised that such a simple thing as click uh, really may not work. And if you do a Google search uh, and uh, search for something, click doesn't work in my uh, automated test. So there are millions of results where people complain when something doesn't work. In some cases, this is because of the test. In some cases, this is because of an application. And it's uh, always very hard to identify uh, the reason why the click actually doesn't work. You look at it, you see that it should work, but it doesn't work. And what to do in this case? So to prove uh, what I am talking about, so let's open uh, Selenium IDE and record click uh, on this button here. 
All right. So let's go here and stop recording. And we have a very simple uh, test. And we can execute it. And we see that our test just passed without any issues. It decided to, that uh, the click was successful. And uh, we see here that a button remains blue. So, and why it happens? It happens because uh, every browser uh, processes uh, DOM event click and uh, real uh, physical click differently. So what, what we can do uh, in this case, so to click on this button, we, we really need to emulate uh, off, uh, operating system level uh, click. So this may be needed when you do uh, autom automation of uh, some uh, complex application. Uh, let's go here to home page, text input. So here is another example. Uh, let me show you how it works. So here is the edit field. Uh, I enter here uh, a new name for my uh, blue uh, button. So my new name for button. And when I click on the button, uh, its name uh, changes. Okay, let's go to recording here, create a new test for text input and record this simple scenario. I click here, enter new name for my button, click on the button, okay, stop, and let's execute our test here. It enters the text, but button name uh, is not changed. So this is also about uh, the way how uh, model uh, of the application is processed internally. So this is the problem of the application, but uh, remember developers, we are not going to change anything for us. So in this case, uh, the only way how to proceed uh, is to uh, emulate uh, OS level uh, keyboard uh, input. All right, let's go to home. What else we have here? Uh, dynamic ID. So here is an example for dynamic ID. We can create a test for it. Adding recording click on our button. Okay, simple test. And of course, uh, the element has ID and the tool uh, uses it to generate uh, the selector. We execute and it doesn't work. So it was pretty expected. And of course, there is a way to fix the test. So you just uh, write another uh, selector, you don't use ID and the test uh, just works. Okay, hidden layers. So proof for that. So what we have here, we have here a button, it's a green button, and when I click on it, another button, blue button, uh, is placed on top of it. So when I click on this blue button, uh, I cannot click on green button anymore, but uh, let's see what happens when we create a test uh, for this simple page. Layers. I start recording, I click on my button. Okay, I need to reload page first. I think I need to have a green button here. Okay, let's uh, delete. All right, record. Clicking on green button, clicking on blue button. Here is our test. And uh, let's try to click two times uh, on the green button. I'm just changing, changing here my ID and execute my test. Okay, so 
the tool was able to click on the button uh, which is not displayed uh, to a user. And if you will try to examine some properties of, of that button, of the green button, it will indicate that the button is visible. It's uh, within screen uh, boundary, and you still be able to send DOM event click to it, and uh, it, it will work. So, as I mentioned before, uh, a way to deal with uh, such uh, cases is to use uh, enters. Okay, so let's uh, return to, to our slides. So, uh, can we do anything about that, about these pitfalls? So, how to be prepared and how to uh, work with all these issues? Uh, the answer is you need to build a framework. Uh, by framework, I mean here a system of uh, processes, uh, tools, and techniques that you are aware of. And uh, here I do not give uh, a favor to any tool and just stick to some general uh, principles. So first, uh, when you are given some complex new application that uh, you need to test, uh, you need to perform uh, application uh, analysis. So you need to find out uh, if it has some dynamic IDs. You need to analyze what attributes are assigned to elements uh, in this application and uh, what attributes can be really used for uh, reliable uh, identification uh, of elements on pages. Attributes that are used uh, can be very different and they differ from one application to another. In some applications, invent their own attribute names uh, for uh, storing uh, some properties of elements. Also, uh, you need to identify what classes uh, can be used for identification. Some classes are used to, for uh, styling, uh, but some classes really have some uh, meaning, uh, some semantical meaning that uh, help to identify an element on the page. And if there are cases like hidden layers, you need to uh, identify uh, anchors. So uh, to do this uh, analysis, uh, you need, uh, of course, you need some um, tools for that. Uh, the first tool that every uh, automation engineer sh should be able to, to use is the uh, expert query. Uh, Chrome, for example, supports it uh, out of the box. For other browsers, you may need to install Install some uh, add-ons uh, to be able to query uh, elements. Also, uh, what may help a lot is the ability to save uh, the DOM tree uh, of an application uh, to XML file. This is something uh, not very common, uh, and uh, we use it uh, at Inflectra actually, and uh, it's pretty uh, powerful and effective approach. Uh, when you save the DOM tree, uh, to XML file, it's much better when you save a page uh, HTML code of the page. Because when you save DOM tree, you really see uh, the structure uh, on which uh, JavaScript is working. And when you save the DOM tree, uh, you have the ability uh, to compare DOM trees to find out some dynamic parts, uh, changing uh, IDs or anything like that. Also, when you have a DOM tree with all the attributes, uh, not only uh, from the markup, but also added uh, by uh, runtime by JavaScript, uh, you can feed this XML to some analysis tools that you may develop and uh, get some results like uh, what attributes uh, to use for uh, element identification. So, for example, uh, we had an experience, uh, we created uh, a simple program in Python, uh, which just loads an XML uh, tree, uh, the DOM tree of some application, and performs some simple calculation regarding uh, 
What impact uh, a particular attribute uh, has on identification of elements uh, on the page? And uh, in this uh, picture, the higher the bar, uh, the most suitable attribute for uh, identification of an element. And if you build this automatically, you quickly see for a new application what attributes uh, can be used for identification. So for example, here we have area label, uh, control name, uh, and title. So these are things that are frequently uh, have some information with which you can uh, identify uh, an element. Also, very important thing uh, when you mm, do this automation is you should uh, minimize your express uh, expression. Now let's compare uh, one and two. So in case one, we have a full express expression that just enumerates nodes uh, in the DOM tree from the root to leaf node. And uh, in the case, second case, we have a minimal expression that uh, is able to find uh, our account uh, element uh, on the page. So why uh, case one is bad? So when something is changed uh, in the application layout, then uh, this part may become invalid and the whole express just become invalid. And you need to fix it. If all your express expressions in your test are full express expressions, then you are in trouble. If you have minimal express expressions or minimized to some extent, then it's much easier to understand uh, why this expression does not work and uh, it's uh, easier to, to fix it. And in many cases, it will just continue to work when you slightly modify your, your application. So when you do all this analysis, uh, attributes, classes, and course, uh, then you may build a kind of uh, web application profile. Uh, it may look like this, or it may be just uh, a text document enumerating what attributes to use for in expert selectors and uh, what classes to use in selectors and what anchors. Uh, uh, are in the application and for example if there is id attribute uh, you may exclude certain uh, values uh, of this uh, attribute uh, for example here we have a regular expression that excludes all ids that are uh, constructed from uh, five letters and uh, in this application it is considered like uh, a dynamic id so when you have such a profile, it may serve uh, as an input uh, to, uh, to automatic generator uh, of express uh, expressions, or it can be used by uh, a tester to manually, uh, as a cheat sheet, to manually uh, create uh, express expressions uh, for elements. So another important theme that uh, complements uh, any testing framework a lot is object uh, repository. So each thing uh, a bit different uh, from uh, a very well-known uh, page object pattern. So it, it complements it. So page object pattern is something uh, that tries to encapsulate what you have on the page. So for example, if you have a page, a login page, then uh, your page object uh, may just have login uh, method that accepts username and passwords and uh, performs all, all things. Object repository is a bit different. Uh, so when you have selectors of element, uh, if you complement uh, this uh, selector with the type of an object, you may build um, a very uh, useful uh, abstraction. So for example, it works very well for complex controls like uh, tables or trees or charts. So what happens typically when there is no uh, object 
uh, support for, for some grid or for some table. When you click on the cell, you know, then uh, each path of the cell is captured. And it's just recognized, uh, the cell is recognized as a single element. But if you consider the whole table uh, as an object, and uh, you may define some properties and actions uh, for this uh, object like uh, row count, column count. You can get column made by index or perform click uh, on a cell by providing row uh, and column. And uh, what's good here is that, uh, for example, if you have an application, uh, such tables uh, can be used in this application uh, everywhere on different pages. And if you have support for such table or for such tree, it makes uh, life uh, much, much easier. Uh, object repository uh, helps with, uh, may help with a lot of things. So actually it may help with recording. So for example, imagine that uh, you click on the cell uh, in the table and the system recognizes that you clicked on the cell in the table. So it stores express expression of a table and it also recognizes the action or keyword that you used and parameters that you need to pass to this keyword. In this case, complexity of the table, internal, so the table are hidden uh, from uh, developers of tests and this may save uh, time, of course. Also, it uh, object repository uh, helps with uh, uh, test uh, composition because uh, objects may be reused uh, in different uh, parts uh, of your test coverage. Also, when you have uh, support for objects, uh, it may be a, a good step for uh, implementing uh, scriptless or codeless uh, testing. Uh, because when you learn an application and you want to interact with it, you just specif specify ID of an object, uh, keyword or action uh, to, to perform and pass some parameters. So this can be done uh, in some uh, visual way and you don't have to bother every time about internal stuff. So how to navigate from the root of the table to a particular cell how to calculate name of a column, column uh, all these things. Also, data-driven testing uh, becomes easier when you use uh, object uh, repository. All right, so it's uh, time to uh, summarize. Uh, so when we do uh, web UI test automation, uh, we may encounter uh, different pitfalls. And uh, when we hit those pitfalls, they can be a real reason uh, why uh, test automation project just may fail. And uh, when you read about test automation, you frequently see statements like, it is easy, it, uh, and when you try uh, login page examples, everything works. And when you start to test uh, some complex application, you hit one of those pitfalls. You try to do something, you, you are searching for solutions. Uh, it's not always very easy to find out what to do. And uh, this is the reason uh, of, the, of a project failure. So how to, uh, what to do about that? So we need to, to be prepared. So, and we need to arm ourselves with uh, application analysis tools. So to see, to, to actually re reverse engineer our application and to see how uh, it is organized internally. So what attributes uh, to use, uh, what attributes not to use, and uh, how to generate uh, really uh, resilient express uh, selectors for elements in this application. Uh, it's good to have an expert generator that can automate the process of uh, generating uh, expert uh, to save time and to not program uh, expert expressions every time uh, manually. 
And it's good to have uh, an object repository, of course. And uh, now we have a place uh, to practice uh, with uh, tools that you have. Uh, there are many tools on the market today. And you can use the UI testing playground uh, website uh, to sharpen your skills and to learn better your test uh, automation tool. So thanks uh, for listening. Uh, here is my contact information and I'm ready for questions. Thank you, Dennis. That was quite a insightful session on UI test automation. So yes, we'll get started with the questions. Uh, we do have quite a few. All right. Uh, so the first question for you, Dennis, is, is uitestingplayground.com only compatible with Selenium IDE? Can we use it to evaluate an automation tool? Uh, it can be used to evaluate uh, anything, any tool. We actually use it to test our tool that we develop at Inflectra. Actually, uh, all the sources uh, of this uh, website are published uh, on the GitHub. So this is uh, something that we give away for, for free and you can use it. So you can, can go on GitHub you can uh, clone the repository and you can even run it locally when you don't have uh, internet connection. Okay. I, just use, I just use Selenium AD because it's free and uh, there is no any BS uh, to, about any commercial tool here. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, under one is, what are the challenges in UI automation that you typically face? Like which are the most frequent ones that you come across? Uh, the most frequent uh, is actually what was put uh, in the title or uh, in the, of the stock. Uh, we see uh, many projects when uh, people uh, who did manual testing before uh, are starting doing uh, test automation and uh, if they test some real application, they hit those obstacles and they uh, don't know what to do. And uh, we need uh, to find a way uh, to educate them and to explain how to deal with these uh, complex problems. And uh, what we see uh, the company at Inflectra, uh, a problem so for, for experienced uh, test automation engineers is how to try to minimize as much as possible a uh, number of uh, cases when you need to manually tweak uh, expert selectors uh, after recording. So what we try to do is to make uh, recording uh, reliable, produce stable, uh, expert expressions. Okay. Um, and the question is, how do you get Selenium scripts or tests from tool to IDE, like uh, Eclipse or IntelliJ? I mean, how do you export? So actually, uh, I'm uh, not a big professional with Selenium. Uh, so, but here uh, in Selenium IDE, you can just save your tests and you can export them. Uh, and as far as I understand, uh, currently uh, what people use uh, for, uh, together with WebDriver is in more, more cases is Catalon Recorder. So I also have it installed. And here uh, it uh, offers exporting uh, of recorded uh, scenarios to various uh, languages. So you can export to Java Ruby, so you can see it here uh, in the tool tip of export. It doesn't show. Okay, so anyway, uh, with Catalon, you can export to different languages. 
Okay. So, so, sorry, can I provide more information here? No, no, that's that's good enough. Um, the attendees already says thank you. Uh, the next one is, and I believe we have this is the final question for now. Uh, what do you suggest? Uh, what do you suggest to do UI testing without tools? We, uh, could you repeat, please? So, do UI testing without tools? Yes. So, would you suggest to do UI testing without tools? Actually, it depends. So, in some cases, I think that even uh, manual testing can be better than uh, test automation. There are complex things that may require from you a lot of effort to automate. And uh, maybe in some cases, it even makes sense to mix uh, manual and uh, auto automated steps uh, in, in a test. So when, when you cannot automate something, you just uh, perform it uh, manually. Uh, actually, uh, there is a um, curve uh, of effort that you invest in your test automation. So first, when you start test automation, you invest uh, much more effort so your uh, you spend more time more resources more money to do test automation and you do not uh, get uh, the return from this uh, immediately uh, but at some point if you reach it then you start getting uh, revenues from your uh, test automation efforts so if you try to do uh, test automation and cannot reach this point, then better to continue to, to test manually. Thanks, and uh, how, how, fast sorry, you sorry. Reach, how fast you reach this point, of course, depends uh, on, on skills and on the tools that you use. Mm -hmm. Okay. So thank you so much for sharing the tool details. Uh, that really helps a lot. And uh, I'm just checking if there are any more. OK, there comes a question. Uh, do you suggest any books for this? Do you, is there any repository, knowledge repository besides this site? Mm, uh, personally, I did, I did not see uh, any published books uh, regarding such uh, technical issues. So mostly in literature, you will find some uh, high level consideration about test automation. So how to start it in, in the company and how to uh, make it effective. Uh, but as for such technical things, so uh, better to use uh, Google for that, uh, participate in community discussions and such webinars. And uh, UI testing playground, we created it uh, recently and we have uh, some ideas which we did not implement here yet. So I think that uh, this list uh, of uh, pitfalls uh, and cases uh, will be growing. Okay. Uh, all right. That's uh, all the questions for now, Dennis. Thank you. So yeah, thank you so much uh, for sharing all the details. Uh, I'm sure our attendees found it very informative and useful too. Mm. Thank you for thanks. hosting me today. Uh, thanks everybody. Thanks again, Dennis. And I really hope to see you in Virginia. So see you there. Yes, see you. All right, everyone. Mm. This concludes our webinar for today. So thanks for joining. And uh, if you want to see more such sessions from speakers like Dennis and others and wish to learn more about UI test automation related subjects, come over to STPCon Fall 2018. And stay tuned for more webinars and online trainings coming soon at softwaretestpro.com. If you haven't signed up yet for the upcoming webinar, which is Demystifying Mobile Application Testing by Raj Subramanian on 22nd, of August, the link is up for registration at softwaretestpro.com. So go ahead. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great week ahead. See you all in Virginia in October 2018. Have a great uh, day ahead. Thank you. Happy learning. Bye.